Greetings, everybody, and welcome to yet another lecture. Uh, this time covering um, well, what I feel is a, a fun piece, a serious piece all at the same time, uh, Susan Orlean's uh, The American Male at Age 10. This was uh, uh, originally uh, published in Esquire magazine, uh, which is a pretty well-known uh, magazine. And what I love about it is the uniqueness of the premise, uh, where you have this woman, I believe she must have been in maybe her late 20s, early 30s, uh, when she wrote this, I would imagine maybe her 30s. And what she thinks to do, and follows through with it, of course, and puts this uh, uh, article together, is to follow along a ten, uh, with a 10-year-old boy named Colin Duffy. And uh, to basically follow him for not just a day or a couple of days, but really a matter of weeks, uh, in and out of his life in a fairly steady and intimate way, uh, getting to know his family, getting to know his friends, but most importantly the focus always being on this young 10 year old boy. Now it's very important to note that this is an article written by an older woman because I do think the giant theme of, uh, let's say, gender issues, right, men, women, male versus female, definitely comes into play uh, and we see that she has chosen deliberately, specifically, a young boy, right, and really seeing what the experience of a young boy is like. Uh, the experience of a young girl and to tell a story like this, to write an article like this, remember based on real people, real places, real things, uh, it, maybe it would be quite different, you could imagine. Uh, but here we have a boy. And I love the way the, uh, uh, the entire article starts. She imagines if her and this young boy were to get married, which we understand is kind of hyperbole. Uh, it's kind of a preposterous ridiculous situation to even imagine, but I think she does it for perhaps thematic effect, which is to say, when you get to the end of this, especially when you see, you start reading some of the things like, uh, we would put rocks and slingshots and, you know, hit my butt with it, right, as being kind of the butt of the joke, uh, literally there, uh, and laughed at and kind of, you know, uh, ridiculed. And that's what she says they would, they would do and she would be a part of this. Um, so, on one hand, you see it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think of a young woman getting with a boy like this uh, and getting married almost in this fantasy way. It's bringing together an unrealistic kind of situation with something that actually is quite real, which is the idea of marriage. Men and women getting married and bringing into these relationships, these, these unions, certain perspectives on, uh, on the genders, right, uh, and bringing that into uh, the relationship. So, the other thing I like to point out here is, by the end of this first paragraph, uh, this kind of silly, ridiculous first paragraph, notice that the, they're doing everything he wants to do. And even though it's kind of weird she's the adult, she should obviously have the leverage and authority here, uh, she's a professional, um, she doesn't have it, right? She, she writes to the effect that she doesn't have that power over this child. Maybe it's because he's a boy. Right? And he's already starting to experience the power of that designation right? and the culture that comes with it. To speak of his situation, uh, there's some questions uh, that we work on that get you thinking about this. But he's, he lives in a pretty nice neighborhood in New Jersey. It sounds like his parents do quite well. I think they both work here. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's a quite a, a nice neighborhood and community uh, that he resides in. Right? Um, they start to talk about some of his... Uh, general interests uh, early on. Uh, Marvel, notice Marvel, uh, he's into it here, Marvel comic uh, action figures. He can't distinguish at, uh, as an adolescence. Uh, he can't distinguish between like action heroes and superheroes and then athletes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that's one of the interesting kind of thematic uh, uh, ideas that comes from this, which is how do we view our athletes? Are they on the same level as superheroes? They can do no wrong. So much expectation, the world riding on their shoulders. And maybe it makes sense that a 10-year-old boy or girl, it uh, doesn't matter in this case, uh, would see uh, kind of uh, the, the, the same type of character in a sports athlete, right? That's constantly on TV, right? All over the place in the news. And the superheroes that we see emerging in such a doing this section right in the beginning of 2021 and Marvel is 
even despite COVID, kind of you know the strongest industry going. Uh, we understand uh, the uh, the power that this has on multiple generations of people. So it just gets into some of his interests here. Um, didn't really take to the Boy Scouts and loves family matters, right? With the young black uh, Urkel, who's kind of the interesting nerd stereotype for an African American. So it's actually quite unique for its time. Uh, an interesting show in. When you look at the ratings for a show like Family Matters, it takes us back to the 90s, I think it was one of the most successful shows going, right? Uh, uh, a uh, uh, African American family, I think based out of Chicago, uh, is what that show is all about. Correct me if I'm wrong on the city. So a big topic I think that we have in this, uh, in this article, and she makes it quite clear, and I like the way she phrases it, is kid up. Not a grown up, but a kid up, which means we're, we're still in both worlds. Uh, we're still a kid, but uh, on the other hand, there are some issues, there are some awarenesses that are starting to build that uh, obviously are a part of an adult world. Some examples that this uh, author uh, uh, mentions uh, in terms of Colin's life and what he talks about in school with his friends, while they don't understand the specifics and you know the entire context of, say, something like uh, AIDS, right, the uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease of AIDS, um, they still know it's out there. They still know it, it, it essentially harms people, right? And this alone is causing them to have confusions, fears, doubts, right? So it's that idea that you're still a kid, but you can only be kind of, you know, completely sheltered or unaware of these real world issues. Another one I think they mention here is racism, right? Uh, how racism becomes more and more of an awareness for young people, uh, uh, especially because you think about ages one to 10, there's probably not that much thought going into racism, racism and our minds aren't able to com uh, comprehend some of these more abstract ideas in our minds, right? Um, racism doesn't exist in a tangible, I can't reach out and touch it. That's all a part of the mind and it could take the mind time, psychologically speaking, to be able to really, really understand that, right? But it's happening and that's what this is about, being a kid up. Another thing they mention here is uh, ideas about responsibility uh, and young people. Uh, of course, always following Colin, but also they're talking about other boys and girls in this class. She's doing that kind of, I, I guess you could call it investigative journalism, uh, where she's really putting herself in the environment that she's trying to uh, um, discuss, right, and share ideas about. So she's really there. Always keep that in mind. Uh, she's in the classroom. And we see that the kids, uh, another emerging kind of adult uh, young adult reality that's coming their way is responsibility and taking on chores and tasks throughout the classroom. For what it's worth, uh, recycling seems to be the most popular. Uh, maybe some of us wouldn't have expected that when we see some of the other things you, uh, the kids are doing. Um, my personal kind of read on this or take on this would be that uh, maybe kids, because of the, the seriousness of recycling, and I don't think it's as advertised or promoted as it was maybe back in the 1990s when it was all kind of new and we had our little boxes for the first time not even the big uh you know garbage can sizes but just i remember i was back east you have your little recycling box and a lot of people didn't even take to it and then you start hearing the statistics on it and like all the stuff that doesn't really get recycled and it's a little dismal i think but the kids it takes them beyond the classroom beyond the small world the small tasks and responsibilities of just that classroom, like putting your chairs up on the desk and da 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 da, or feeding the class animal, whatever it might be. Um, and now the world is benefiting from the work they're doing. So I think that's why there's such an eagerness on behalf of all the students in the class to want to do the recycling job, right? I like this line. This speaks to what I mentioned just a moment ago, how there is this real world uh, to uh, that's coming their way. And the way she puts it is, quote, uh, these jolts of sobriety uh, in the midst of rank goofiness are a 10-year-old's specialty. Uh, man, I don't know if I could teach those ages where there is this... I've never experienced it. I've only been around teenagers. I've been around ninth graders, uh, 13, 14 years of age, and they, they're goofy enough. And I would imagine when you go back to like 10-year-olds, it's even more goofiness. But what the author is getting us to think about is that overall world of goof, uh, goofiness that a 10 year old is usually trapped in especially boys because i think we know girls mature just that's a fact 
girls mature uh, more quickly, right, earlier on, in many ways. Uh, so especially young boys, there's, uh, most, of, most of your time is spent being goofy. I can attest to that from what I remember of those ages, burping, doing anything to make, just laugh, laugh, giggle, giggle, everything's funny. Language is probably very funny and experimental. Some of you might have kids and your kids are starting to say maybe things they shouldn't or at least goofy things. However, at age 10, there's also, look at that disease, AIDS, uh, and it's actually having an effect. Uh, I see these people fighting about this whole idea of white and black. What's that all about? Um, real loss, I think a lot of us can probably remember the first time uh, somebody close to us, whether it was family or extended family or friend, passed away. Um, and that, that's, that, that's a reality uh, that starts to creep into us uh, at that age as well. To put a cap uh, just through some kind of uh, example here, uh, Colin and Japather, you know, talking to her one night and uh, she mentions that if she has kids, they ask, do you want to have kids? And she says, yes, but I want girls, which is an inter interesting reply from our uh, author here, right? Um, Colin says, uh, will you have an abortion if you find out you have a boy, right? So if you want girls, will you have an abortion? Notice that as a 10-year-old, he knows about this idea of abortion, but not enough to be sensitive and to not really ask a question in that way to anyone, uh, whether it be an adult or really anyone. So it's not real. There's still something kind of mythical about it. However, it is a real thing, right? And it's something uh, uh, that's very serious within the world. So it's kind of a blending. I think that's what a kid up is. It's a few ways of interpreting that, but it's really the, the seriousness of the world still starting to kind of strike at, as you said, these jolts, starting to strike at that usually kind of fantastical and goofy world uh, that we have as a 10 year old. All right, so this is uh, where we get into, I uh, get to talk a little bit about maybe one of my favorite video games of all time. What can I say? Street Fighter 2. I just bought the arcade one up cocktail cabinet. Uh, and it's not the best way to play it because it's like a tabletop, but I got my Street Fighter there and I got these different versions of it. And it's like a dream come true because I honestly played the crap out of this game. Uh, whether it was in the arcade, so it speaks to my childhood, or this was uh, Street Fighter 2, as she mentions here. Not just big in the arcades, but it's going to be with the Super Nintendo, with the Genesis, I guess, other systems. Uh, it's going to be the biggest home release uh, ever uh, up to that point, because everybody wanted this. And they did a good job on the port, to be honest, uh, in terms of making it uh, good for the, the, the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. They did a good job with it, so that was good, too. But just, you got to understand the huge sales, uh, the huge financial and cultural impact that this game had. Maybe some of you out there are fans. I'm a huge fan. I love Street Fighter 2. Um, so I just want to kind of just uh, really build that context of how big this game was. Now, what are the critical kind of issues that we can talk about with this game? I'll get one of them out of the way quickly. It's the fact that there's one female character. Like there's that over that's that 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 overarching theme of gender issue and that trickles into and breaks down into all kinds of different things right but there's only one female representation in this game now this game is back taking us back to the 90s right and i'm dating myself heavily by telling you this we're going like right into the heart of my childhood right in this era so it's, it's nostalgic for me a little bit but i didn't think about these issues back then but because uh, the game was just fun, etc. It's competitive. Uh, but yeah, one girl character, which by today's standards, 2021, is unacceptable. Uh, I think like a game like Overwatch, uh, other, which is a first-person shooter, kind of cartoony, but I, as far as I understand, a lot of female characters, right? Um, where female characters now have more important roles in the games that we play, in the movies that we watch, etc. So, but if you go back to the 90s, which doesn't seem, and we get very nostalgic about the 90s, oh, it was the best time period, right? Whatever, some people may say. Yes, but we didn't see a lot of uh, 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 women uh, in video games, representations in video games, and also film. I'm not going to talk a lot about film, but that's another huge thing to consider. I always like to share with my students once I've, I heard about this years ago. I don't know the name of it. It escapes me, but there's an organization that... Uh, it's a, a, a more or less a, a, I wouldn't call it a, I guess maybe a feminist organization, but it speaks to women and women's representation in film, and they rate films. Like almost all the films that are out there, they rate them 
based on some questions that they ask about the film. And some of those questions are, are there, is it more than one woman in the film? Uh, do those two characters, if more than one, actually speak to each other in coherent, meaningful, you know, interesting comments? Or is it just eye candy, right? And just kind of there to serve no purpose? Um, uh, yeah, is, uh, is the woman always just kind of the love interest and that's all she is, right? Is that the only role that some of these are uh, filling? I just watched a, a little bit of a Wonder Woman 84 review and some people are saying that it falls back on old tropes of a woman needing a man uh, to kind of save and rescue her, even though she's ironically like the lead of the film and the superhero, but it's, it's, it's finding it hard to rely on a new way to tell a story about a man and a woman. Um, that's one way of seeing the film, of course, but I'm just trying to make it as relevant as possible. But going back, going back, going back to Street Fighter 2, uh, one girl, Chun-Li, and we find this a lot in video games, uh, film, uh, uh, and anime, uh, the kind of hyper-sexualized uh, uh, rendering of the bodies and almost impossible uh, kind of uh, attributes that they give to the female characters, such as very busty, but then very slim on the waist with gigantic kind of you know legs or whatever. The legs are nice slim, nice legs as well. So the, the body types are unrealistic. And this is oftentimes what we get. Chun-Li, though, I think um, uh, nothing by today's standards in certain video games, but Chun-Li, you know, there was a lot of, there was legs and there was uh, stuff like that that were kind of shown off in the character, right? So not only is there only one character, but they're only really filled this kind of eye candy uh, uh, and very super uh, uh, stereotypical uh, kind of body physique, right? Um, nobody wants to be her. Um, and I don't remember if that was the case when I was a kid playing with people, but maybe you could argue that there's a reasoning behind it, which is nobody wants to be the girl, right? Look at all these guys to choose from. Uh, in fact, there's a character, he's a boss named Vega, and he's from Spain, but he's given very feminine attributes, caring about his face, his beauty, uh, even very slender in terms of a character build. But notice they still had to make him a man. Why not make that a woman and give us two characters? but it's mostly a pool of men. Even when they expand it four more characters and you have 12 characters to choose from, you're still just gonna have Chun-Li with one character. That will eventually change. And now if you follow any of these video games, I'm sure they, they make sure uh, to try to give a wide array of choice um, with female characters in mind. Another thing I'll say really quickly because it's all about video games is a lot of these current modern games allow you to build your own character. Cyberpunk 77, uh, 2077, uh, I'll buy that eventually, I'm sure. Um, but you can be a girl, you can be a guy, you can make your own uh, 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 gender uh, uh, choices in terms of a uh, gender preference and stuff like that. So they're, they're really trying to cater to that fluid identity as much as they possibly can, I think. Uh, because it's a, you know, it's a growing part of their uh, gaming market, right, and the people that are, are playing games, so they have to. Uh, plus, it's the right thing to do, right? It's the politically correct thing to do as well. Uh, so, things have definitely changed since the 90s, going back to Chun-Li, uh, who was the only girl in the game. They play at a pizzeria named Dan uh, called Danny's, and it's just grease and video games and kids and getting all kind of, you know, competitive, and it's just everything you would expect of kind of the environment, right? with these young kids, these kids who are uh, becoming, you know, young adolescents here, right, going to be teenagers within a few years here. And it's a mix of young, old, and everybody in between, which means there's a pecking order. Uh, the old kids on top, and I think a lot of us would agree to this as we grew up, even amongst girls perhaps, uh, the guys, the older guys are on top easily enough, and then, you know, everybody goes in rank of age, and I guess that's why we're always like, I'm, I'm 11 and a half. Oh yeah, well I'm 11 and three quarters, right? And we're just trying to inch each other out simply by age alone. Eventually you get to be old enough where you're like, little increments of age don't really matter all that much, right? Uh, but back then it makes a huge difference, especially because we're locked into grade levels, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, right? And, and everything before that as well. So um, what the author does is kind of transitions from uh, none of the young boys wanting to be Chun-Li, and I would say use Chun-Li, she's excellent, she's got great moves, 
uh, you can win with her. Uh, and then she transitions into this I, the, the overall general treatment of girls in the classroom. And it is less than desirable. Um, and I guess I'm always personally reflecting because it's about childhood, so it's kind of a cool article to do that with. And I don't know. I didn't treat girls like this. Maybe once in a while, I don't know, but maybe other guys did more often. But just being very mean to girls. And I think, I'll give you three seconds to think about the question. Does that speak to your experiences where guys generally mean to girls in these early ages? All right. They're quite mean. In the, in the case of Colin and his friends, they call them really nasty names. Maggot, Diarrhea, reminds me of Beavis and Butthead. <clears throat> and they used to do that to Daria. And they would always call her Diarrhea. And she had a spinoff show too. Um, so I guess I, I heard this in a TED Talk. Like early on in these early ages, you're so desperate to be a part of the guy crew that you have to reject and oppose even everything that is female and kind of what you consider female. So it would be pink, the color pink. Uh, perfume, oh, get that stuff away from me, right? Uh, whatever it's going to be, you start to reject everything that you consider girl, girly, or female more and more and more because you want to be a part of the guy group and you come to kind of be a part of it because that acceptance is just way more important than anything in the early ages. And I think that's probably what's here. However, remember we go back to that idea of being a kid up. Relationships are starting to occur. Jepeth says, I think, um, you know, he's got all these different girlfriends. So he's already starting to think along those lines of uh, potential relationships. And that's different for everybody. I know I had relationships very early uh, in my life. Whereas I know other people don't have any at all. Uh, so there's a wide spectrum. Um, but it's still just, you know, on the outskirts. Maybe a few people and then other kids start to hear about it and uh, have their own thoughts about it, right? I think it's very ironic that you, that they try to go with the most kind of disgusting, uh, you know, in, uh, um, uh, insulting name that they can, like take changing Maggie to Maggot, right? And they go for something super disgusting. Um, it just seems very dramatic, right? To go from just a nice girl sitting there and then to change her into something as disgusting as possible uh, through name. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, that's what that's what they're essentially doing. Now, <clears throat> they, uh, here's, here's the important line here, and I'll just read it. Um, Psychologists identify 10, the age of 10, as roughly the age at which many boys experience the gender-linked normative developmental trauma that leaves them as adult men at risk for specific uh, psychological sequelae of often manifest as deficits in the arenas of intimacy, empathy, and struggles with commitment and relationships. So 10 is where, I guess, in my own words, like paraphrasing this, is where a lot of damage can be done to young boys along these, in terms of their future with these things. In Intimacy, empathy, and struggles with uh, commitment in relationships. So all of these really fundamentals of being in a relationship uh, and having uh, an understanding with somebody day in, day out, right? Because relationships are not easy. Um, that's the age of 10, uh, psychologists uh, say, according to the author, where trauma can start to take place. Things that will affect those, certain, those uh, specific categories later on in their lives. Um, so interesting uh, to think about the long-term effects that are occurring you know, at the early ages of 9, 10, 11 years of age. I, I always find this uh, humorous, uh, but I think that's part of the effect of this article is to, you know, through some humor and situations that only 10-year-olds can kind of find themselves in, we still are able to uncover, analyze the uh, important theme or the important point uh, uh, that, that, that's there. This is funny. Um, you know, they're doing sexual education. They're doing stuff like that. And there's also, you know, changing in the locker room and stuff. And I don't know. I know when I, I, know when I was in school, nobody really did much in the locker room outside of 
get ready for gym class and that was it, right? Nobody was really taking showers uh, and stuff like that. I guess athletes, you know, after hours and stuff, but whatever the case may be. But for these 10 year olds at Collins School, it's the, for the girls when they have to go in and change and, you know, gym class, whatever, uh, or for the pool, it's not a problem. Not a problem. Girls just do it, whatever. For the guys at this age, uh, not, and the author never really says too much about some of these observations or what she hears. She just kind of lays them out, provides the context, and then kind of steps back and lets you make up your own mind about it. But for the guys, it was an ordeal. Uh, they were all over the place, right? Um, and you, you would ask the, the question, the critical, think, uh, qu uh, quest the critical question would be, why do they have such issue? Why do young boys, in a situation where they simply have to get ready for the pool, uh, why would they have such issue uh, doing this? Pantsing each other or something, right? That's what they say. Giving each other a lot of, you know, um, you know, really getting, uh, 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 getting on each other's case, right? Um, it just seems uh, like a lot of activity for something as simple as getting ready to go out to the pool. Uh, but the ages here and the, the difference between the girls and the guys is quite extreme in this example. Colin's very quick to give his opinions. I think that's also part of that kid up uh, idea, which is um, uh, there. You know, there's a world out there that I can now cast my opinions on, and people are willing to listen to my opinions. Uh, she goes through quite an extensive kind of uh, list here uh, of things he thinks are good, things he think uh, he thinks are cool, right? And he's got all kinds of opinions. We uh, uh, can imagine how many of these opinions have been impacted by adults in his life or things that he hears on TV uh, in this um, a very important developmental stage of his life. Love his answer, and I'm sure uh, if you're a mom out there, you would love it too. I think the most he says, you know, who's the most beautiful woman in the world? And he goes through the cliched responses there for the time, which is Madonna, yes, uh, Cindy Crawford, right? very successful mainstream supermodel. Um, and then he says, nah, uh, my mom. And maybe that's the kid, right? Still, the mom is everything at this point in his life, right? And I think that takes us to the end too when he's in the backyard of his own home, still feeling very safe and linked uh, to that environment. Maybe it speaks to how he feels about his parents still at this age too. A lot of, you know, big topic here, I won't say much to it, but his money, and how much this uh, kind of takes of his attention. And it seems to take a, a fair good amount, a fairly good amount. Um, he has these unrealistic kind of uh, expectations. He thinks lawyers make 400000 a year. Yeah, maybe like if you're doing really well in Los Angeles or a city like that. Uh, but most lawyers are not making that kind of money, right? They're probably making closer to 100 I would imagine, maybe even less as you start off. Uh, if you start to look at salary, uh, you know, kind of uh, trends. Um, he's really into money. He talks about the lottery. And that's another critical question we can ask is why such a uh, obsession with the lottery? It's this idea of windfall, meaning what windfall means is like I have an apple tree outside and we had a lot of apples on it actually, at least like 10, 12 apples. And when those gusty winds come through, there comes my windfall, baby. Here comes my apples. They drop to the ground and I can take those to the market. I'm not really doing that, but you get the idea. That's a, just money coming into my life, right? kind of falling with the wind. And that's what he expects. Um, and that's why I think he latches onto the idea of the lottery because it's simply you win and then it kind of rains money into your life. And um, I think a lot of us understand, maybe that's why we're here in the class right now and we're pushing our way through with this class, other classes, is that it takes more than just, you know, dumb luck uh, or, you know, thinking that you're going to win the lottery here. It does happen. Some people really do strategically play the lottery, you know, whatever. Uh, but overall, life is way more complicated. It's a bit more boring in the sense that you kind of have to work for it, right? Which can be very rewarding as well. But he's 10. So his thoughts about money are still kind of tied in fantasy, uh, uh, but, you know, mixed with some of these things that he's hearing about, which just sound enticing, uh, like winning the lottery. I'm still going to cross my fingers I win the lottery uh, someday in my life. The problem is, is I don't buy any tickets and I don't play. So I will probably have to do something different. He wants to live in Wyoming. 
this is part of his kind of fantasy is the, the kind of mythical mindset of a 10 year old uh, again crit you know if we're getting critical about it for just a moment maybe he likes the idea of just being away from his current environment maybe he's kind of outliving it he's outgrowing it uh, and you think of Wyoming and this ranch kind of uh, uh, environment he wants to be in it's very open right and, and it, you just think about it just kind of spreading out for miles uh, very different than the life uh, he lives in this you know, completely suburban neighborhood uh, in New Jersey um, I missed a point so just to back up because uh, usually I kind of for the most part go chronologically through these uh, these articles and we're almost done here uh, but I didn't want to overlook the point that um, his bedroom itself is kind of a uh, expression of his changing interests and we're starting to see some things that uh, even for Colin maybe seem a bit out of place like the feverish uh, quote-unquote feverish uh, picture of a woman a cologne a, 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 a ad that he got out of a magazine of a woman and so speaking to some of those emerging young adolescent young teen uh, uh, kind of you know interests uh, but still being you know a kid uh, as well right so the, the bedroom itself is an expression of that I love the way she ends it it feels a lot like 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 fiction uh, at the end here because there's so much uh, imagery involved in symbolism I believe and it's the web uh, the giant spider web that Colin likes to pretend he's building in his backyard uh, I'll be quick but to say just a couple things um, what I like about this uh, firstly is it's all within his backyard this is his domain um, and notice that at, uh, on one hand it's great as a young boy to have this whole backyard and it's your play area and your imagination can roam free and he still has this vivid imagination of a 10 year old I'm making a spider web right sounds like something I would do I'm making a spider web going around here right and going all around and I love to do like pretend play like that up until a pretty late age I think um, however it's also a very small environment you know trapped this is where you belong. Um, someday you can leave this, but not right now. And you're still under this kind of guidance, protection, uh, the mandate, the authority of your parents, right? So there's still that kind of in place. Um, and I know there's a there's a interesting psychological stages that young people go through when they start to realize the limitations of their environments and they start to blame it on their parents and it becomes a real struggle, right? So there's a lot going on there. Um, what I also like about this is it's setting up this final understanding of being caught in a web because she says it right at the end she and the female dog uh, are now trapped within the spider web this kind of imaginative he uses like uh, I think it's fishing line or something like that and he goes around uh, and he says it's a real web that he's creating and here we have two women at the very end of this story one being an adult one being of course a female dog here uh, but they're both trapped within the web that a young boy, soon to be young man, right? Uh, as we kind of transition through some of these ages, um, trapped in the web that he has created, right? So there is that sense of even a grown woman being trapped within the idea of what this young boy represents in terms of the culture he grows up with. Um, you know, we talk about the privilege of boys. Uh, we talk about... Uh, I use these terms just because they, they, they are out there, not that I agree with it one way or the other, uh, toxic masculinity. Um, and so there are some current relevant issues um, that speak to this idea of men in society, the power of men in society, what it means for women, right? There's lots of different topics that come from that. Um, but everybody trapped in the web here uh, at the very end, all right? I find this is a, a, a well-done article. I find it cool just the unique premise of it of following this young boy around for weeks upon end uh, and finding out about his life his interests, and most importantly uh, the way his mind works um, at this crucial stage all right thank you uh, and i hope you're having a beautiful day i hope the semester is going well and i will see you next time